Yo, Selihun ist am Start auf selihun.com, dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft Server Laser Gurkenland. Äh, und wir, wir hören heute den Talk weiter an. Von dem Channel Brian Clough, äh, der Talk von Aaron Jones, Introduction to Tor. Wir sind bei Minute 40 und 39 Sekunden. Ähm, ja, genau, also let's go. Aaron Jones, Introduction to Tor auf sillyhoon.com, dem gerade sehr reichbaren Minecraft Server, der auch unter der IP 1.9.2.7.134 erreichbar sein wird, sollen, sollte. Ähm, gerade niemand online hier, alles klar, let's go. Introduction to Tor, Aaron Jones. Come to the webpage, click on it. It's about 11 minutes, maybe 16 minutes. But it is about a couple in Seattle who get harassed by the police for running a tour exit note. Now, let's discuss this. And I really wish I could show you the video because it really, really bothers me. I have a lot of problems with it, what they're saying. So this couple, they uh, run a tour exit note in their home in Seattle. They're part of like a privacy group and uh, From that tour exit note, they just allow anybody to go out to the internet. Okay, not the brightest of ideas to do it from your home, but they decide to do that. Now, this was early on in the days of tour, so law enforcement wasn't familiar with what was going on with tour yet. I'm just, I can just tell you that right now. Your average cop was not familiar at that time with tour. Now, we have training now where they talk about tour for Ach stimmt, er ist ja auch Polizist, das habe ich gerade vergessen. Ja.
So when we discuss tort and the manner in which many of these individuals complain about the harassment that they're experiencing due to their participation as an exit router, we need to look at the laws concerning accomplice liability, and you should also read more about accomplice law. Now this is important because this is going to come up eventually. Like, I'm telling you guys things that's going to happen within a few years. Is everybody familiar with the idea behind accomplice liability? No? So you're going to hear about this in the news fairly shortly because it's starting to become a hot ticket item in terms of this is the next thing. Uh, everybody was really, really pissed off about the search and seizure and then port asset forfeiture. Everybody remember that? You get in trouble and you got $30,000 in your car. Well, you got in trouble and you had money, so they just take your money. That's asset forfeiture. So the new thing is accomplice liability. And what this is is if you assist somebody in a crime, and do not actively attempt to stop them, you are just as guilty as they are. Yeah, I'm gonna example, look through it. I will give you an example. What the fuck? Uh, I jump in my car, and I go, and I show up at your house, and I say, hey man, jump in the car with me. We gotta go to 7-Eleven. And so you get in the car with me, and we go to 7-Eleven. And as we're walking in, you look over, and I'm pulling a Max down over my face, and pulling out the Mac 10, and we walk into that 7-Eleven, and you thought that we were going to buy beer, but instead I stick the guy up, and I tell you, grab the cash. And so you grab the cash, and as we're walking out, boom, I blow away the guy who's running the cash register. We jump in the car, and we run. Well, when the police shows up, and they finally arrest us, or whatever happens, uh, you, for being part of that crime, are guilty for murder. I am guilty for murder. And if there was anybody else in the car who helped keep the engine run, running, that person would be guilty for murder as well. That's accomplice liability. That's the act of being an accomplice to a crime and being responsible 100% for that crime. So the car going to my girlfriend who was at work at the time? Uh, that's going to be between you and the lawyer, man. Because I've seen some pretty, um, some pretty shaky accomplice liability prosecution. And it's stuff that, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I wouldn't have brought that forward, but other people have, and sometimes it comes down to, do you have enough money to defend yourself? So then it could be used as a against her. All kind, yeah, all kinds of stuff could be, yeah, sure. Uh, there's actually an example in here for the complicity, uh, complicity and the accomplice law. There is actually an example of what happens if I come to you and I tell you I'm going to commit a crime, and then you tell me not to, or what if you tell me to do it, and then later send me a letter that says don't do it. There's all kinds of like examples of these crimes being uh, prosecuted. So I would definitely look into it. So what does this have to do with TOR? Well, if you're running an exit node, are you an accomplice to somebody being able to gather child pornography, to buy drugs, to purchase heroin? What if they die? So you're running the tour exit note that somebody used to go out and buy heroin. That person goes, gets home, shoots up, they overdose and die, and then eventually they are able to track back that purchase all the way to you. Should you be responsible for that? Now, I think not, but with FOSTA and the Cloud Act and everything else that's coming through, it would not be a large leap to be able to say, this person who is running an exit node should be responsible for what's going through their network because they were an accomplice in that person being able to commit that crime. They used your internet, they used your bandwidth, they used your server, and not only that, you had to set that server up so you put in work to make sure that that exit node worked. That's a really, like, it's a really shitty argument, right? I see some faces out here who are like, well, I, I, I don't want to hear that. But that's <laughs> what we're moving toward. Would that make like someone goes to the library and logs on there? Good question, because we're going to get to that as well, because that actually is going on within the Tor uh, network. They're actually setting up exit nodes at libraries. And there's a big fight about that as well. So we're going to get to that. So guess what? Tor, and I'm going to check the time. I'm sorry, our clock isn't working. So Tor is used to commit crimes. It just is. It is. Guess what? Freenet is too. The open net 
is used to commit crimes. Cars, planes, trains, even banjos have been used by criminals or became instruments in crimes. And we don't try to ban them, spy on people for owning them, or worry that our neighbors may be serial pumpernickelers. So, in 1988, a murder was committed in Britain in which a man was beaten to death with bread. Somebody took some pumpernickel and beat this dude to death with the bread. Okay? Was he the neighbor? No, and he wasn't. He wasn't. And it wasn't in the parlor. Yeah, I got a chuckle out of it. Thanks. Poor guy. I'm sorry, dude. Uh... So privacy is a fearful thing, and those who wish to retain, retain their right to privacy are considered strange, scary, weird, all kinds of things. I like privacy. I should have a right to be private. The things that I give you on the internet, that's my right to give you those things, but if I don't want to give them to you, I shouldn't have to. That's, that's how I feel. However, when law enforcement is investigating a crime and they trace that criminal activity to your home, they will want to better understand why your home is being used for criminal behavior. If I follow somebody to your house because they're buying crack at your house, and I find out that your house is a crack house, I'm going to want to investigate that. But what is the difference between if I follow digital data to your home and find out that your house is being used to distribute crack digitally, well, am I going to investigate that? Sure. Providing an exit note and advertising that your home is used to traffic child pornography drugs, anything else is going to grab law enforcement attention. It's just, it's going to happen. Those privacy advocates who provide exit notes do so at the risk of their traffic being marked as hostile or as a carrier of illegal traffic. They're making a sacrifice to put this stuff up online or to give you an opportunity to be able to have access to an exit note, but to the flip side of that, they're also putting... Ich, ich weiß, ich, irgendwie hat mich der Kart auf die Idee gebracht, was, was wäre denn, wenn man einen ein Exit Note äh, hostet und eine, eine Blacklist verwendet. Oder sogar eine Whitelist, noch krasser. Eine Whitelist mit IPs, zu denen äh, der, der Traffic gehen darf. Äh, ich weiß, ja, Censorship, die Stars, das ist alles scheiße und so. Aber ich meine, wenn es fehlschlägt, dann wird ja einfach ein anderer Exit Note verwendet. Also man macht ja nicht Tor damit kaputt. Aber so könnte man selber auf der sicheren Seite sein, dass nur äh, dass das die Tor-Usage, die durch einen selber durchgeht, nur legitim ist und, und könnte somit die legitime Nutzung von Tor unterstützen, ohne illegitimen oder ill illegalen, was heißt legitim, ich meine eher legal, illegalen äh, Traffic eine Plattform zu geben. Ich weiß nicht, vielleicht gibt es da schon irgendwelche Setups und so, weil das wäre... Ich weiß nicht, ob es eine komplett falsche Ansicht gerade ist, weil, weil man ja eigentlich nichts beschränken will oder so. Aber eigentlich kann man das natürlich auch als, als das Gegenteil von Beschränkung sehen, weil Leute, die dadurch eingeschränkt waren, dass sie gesetzlich keine Exit Notes äh, betreiben konnten, ohne äh, irgendwie Kopfschmerzen zu haben oder so, ne? Sagt man das im Deutschen? <lacht> ähm, den ist mit so, mit so einem Filter die Tür geöffnet, Exit Notes zu hosten. Und, und Leute, die auf Seit, Seiten gehen oder auf Adressen oder was auch immer gehen wollen, außerhalb dieser, ähm, dieser Whitelist. Ja gut. Ja gut, ich meine, es, es gibt natürlich auch ja... Seiten, die nicht sketchy sind, wo man sketchy Sachen drauf machen kann und dafür Tor verwenden, okay, und dann kann man da trotzdem für belangt werden. Ich glaube, das ist der Haken. Ah ja, okay. Ja, nee, das ist blöd. Ja, nee. Nee. Ja, okay, das macht dann keinen Sinn. Hm, ja, da müsste man den ganzen Traffic dafür analysieren, aber, naja... Der ist wahrscheinlich encrypted, mal abgesehen davon, das ist Quatsch. Ah, oh, schade. Äh, naja, aber vielleicht ist es besser als nichts. Aber auch nicht wirklich, oder? I don't know. Okay. <lacht> Wollte ich nur mal so in den Raum werfen. Weiter geht's mit Aaron Jones' Introduction to Tor. ...themselves in a vulnerable, 
vulnerable position where they're open for investigation. So I'm going to give you my word of advice here. Do not run an exit node from your home, and if you do decide to run an exit node on a server owned by a hosting company, make sure you pick a company that understands what you are doing and how to handle law enforcement requests for information. You do not want to go to DigitalOcean and set up a copy of a Tor exit node and then just sit there quietly. You need to make sure that the company that you're hosting your Tor exit node with knows that when law enforcement sends a letter to them, they need to have a pre-built letter that says this is a Tor exit node, you will not find the legal content on this server, so on and so forth. Here's everything. If you need more information, contact us. There are letters that the FBI gets all the time that says this is a Tor exit node. Okay? You need to start doing that so that you can take a little heat off so that somebody doesn't come run up on you while you're in a restaurant and put cuffs on you and put your face in the dirty floor at Denny's. Okay? Because that happens. So how do we set this up? Set your security to high. Disable JavaScript with no whitelists. Some people like to whitelist JavaScript sites. Do not do that. You don't want to have any place where JavaScript is turned on. And you also need to make sure that your Tor is running somewhere where it is at, where it is at or is close to 24-7 uptime. Because what are we doing? Every time your Tor machine turns off, we're just snipping the ribbon. And we're, we're giving them some kind of of um, evidence through metadata. If it runs 24-7, that's much harder to be able to say when you were using it. But if you only turn it on when you're using it, it's much easier to say, well, they were using it at this time, and I got some server records over here that show that a Tor user was connected at the exact same time. I can one-to-one -one this. And that's good enough for a warrant that goes further. Change of state fingerprinting. However, let's ask, who made Tor? Who really actually made Tor? Does anybody know? Hard mode, don't read the, don't read the thing yet? <laughs> Correct. So Tor was originally developed as a method for the United States government to provide bi-directional communications over the internet where the source and destination are hidden from view. They needed it for spies, okay? We have agents within non-permissive environments, foreign countries, they needed to be able to communicate back to the United States without their traffic being monitored. So that's, that's how it started. The Department of Defense, Naval Intelligence, and DARPA deployed TOR in order to protect their assets and to hide their activities. It was never intended as a tool for dissidents or as a tool to protect users from government spying. It was never. Okay? Just never, ever, ever intended for that use. It was created to facilitate spying while using the noise produced by others to mask their behavior. The more people who use it, the more hidden you are. You're building more weeds. So you, as a user of Tor, are a smokescreen for all of the other stuff that Tor is being used for. But you get the added benefit of using Tor. Now, Tor is not shy about revealing their military applications for their tool on their site. Who uses Tor? Hey, there's the military right there. They talk about it. You surf down far enough within their webpage, you can find out who's really using Tor. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Tor is, first and foremost, a military and U.S. government oriented tool and provides benefits such as anonymous communication to the public as a side effect of that mission. That is not the actual mission of the tool. But you might be asking, why would you think that? Like maybe the military just uses it sometimes, or maybe it's just we get the benefits, but the military gets the side effects, right? Could be the other way around. Well, let's talk about their financials. So if we go to their financials, we can pull up the Tor financial reports and they're kind of behind. Their 2017 stuff should have already been out by now, but it, for whatever reason, it's not out. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. Bless you. But you can see who is paying them, how much they're being paid, where the donations are coming from, and where they're spending money on different aspects of the project. Uh, there's a thing called a Form 990. 
look for those. Whenever you're interested in a project that touts that they're a nonprofit, find their 990 financial forms, read it. it. Tells you a ton of information about the project, okay? Now, some believe that TOR is funded by the US government. Got another link for you with more to back this up. And I wanna make sure everybody knows for everything that I say, I'm linking directly to different news articles in different places. Now this guy, I hate when they do this because this is good information, but it's really, really, um, what's the word? I'm gonna use the word provocative. Like they make it sound like an extremely terrible thing that they're supported by the US government and that a ton of money comes in from the government. And when I say a ton of money, I mean millions, okay? Uh, 6.1 million just from the BDG, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so they make this very, very provocative, and he talks about how like he feels betrayed because they're not a grassroots organization. They're removing, they're receiving money from the government. That doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, as far as the product is concerned. The fact that they receive money from the government—that's not a, that shouldn't stop you from using it because it's still a, a effective tool that provides what it provides, but you need to understand that some of the things that are touted are not the things that it provides. If you know what this tool does for you, then it's fine. But don't use it for something that it wasn't intended for, okay? So, the BBG, which is the American Propaganda Company, I just mentioned it, but I'm gonna do it again. They provided about $6.1 million to tour, okay? So $6.1 million comes from the BBG. Is everybody familiar with the BBG? No? So uh, anybody ever heard of something called uh, Free Radio America? American Free Radio? Places like that? Uh, Free Asia Radio? No? Okay. So in foreign nations, in countries overseas, we have a uh, stated mission of bringing freedom to these countries. We bring them information about democracy, we bring them different information about uh, news articles and things like that that we feel are important. Now, most of what the BBG targets is going to be Southwest Asia. Uh, you're looking at Egypt, uh, some African nations, uh, in addition to that, places like Iraq, Iran, all those countries and if you go to the BBG Twitter, which you can, most of it's gonna be targeting those nations, okay? So a lot of it Ouch. really doesn't apply to us, so I'm not surprised that we, within this room, wouldn't really know what they're doing because most of it consists of doing things like, America's awesome because we have clean water and if you want clean water, you should be a friend of America. And then they show pictures of like people drinking clean, clean water or they'll say something like, uh, if you wanna be able to go to college, America has the best colleges in the world, you should come to America to, to go to college, but in addition to that, you should be pro-American. They have these very blatant uh, propaganda-ish messages that they put out. Yes. Similar to what the BBC does, only really catch. Kind of, yeah. So, in addition to that, I tried to look up, there's a group called Rise Up, and Rise Up is really, really in tight with TOR, and uh, they kind of support each other but I couldn't find any of the financial information for Rise Up. So if you do have it or a link to it, if you could pull, do a pull request and give me that inside this talk, I would appreciate it. Or if anybody's watching this, that'd be awesome. Because I searched for several hours and could not find it. Uh, because I wanted to take each one of these groups that are providing money and other forms of support and put it all in there. But some of them, even though they are nonprofits, I couldn't find their financial data, which seemed weird to me. Obviously, it's gotta be somewhere for them to link it to the government so they don't get in trouble, but I couldn't find it. Being supported by the government and getting your money from the government should tell you two things. They have contacts within the government and they can get things done. And B, somebody cares enough to make sure that they're well-funded. Uh, and if you can also look at the programmers, so you know how I told you to look at the GitHub and then look at the programmers? Some of those programmers are paid and you can see how much they're getting paid and I think everybody on the list 
as far as I can see in, in their actual uh, financial statement, everybody there is well over six figures. So another thing to keep in mind, they're, they're making a ton of money off of this. So what is Tor supposed to do? It enhances your privacy and gives some level of identity protection. Everybody get that? Enhances privacy, some levels of protection. Very important. Does not make you invisible. Does not make you invincible. Does not do any of these things. It is a supplement. And also, it is a supplement to good operational security and just smart behavior. This thing is not going to save you when you're the dread pirate Roberts and you decide to get on Stack Overflow and post, hey guys, I run the Silk Road and it's a kick ass place to buy heroin and dope and hookers. And in addition to that, does anybody know how to fix this really basic Apache problem? <lacht> uh, <also here lacht> Geile Reference. Also für die Leute, die das nicht kennen, der, der Dude, der die Silk Road gerannt hat, also ich weiß nicht, ob Silk Road schon erwähnt wurde, das ist halt so ein großer, ne, illegaler Markt, ne, hat er ja gerade erklärt, der äh, hat anfangs, um die Silk Road zu bewerben, unter seiner, ich glaube, richtigen oder E-Mail-Adresse mit seinem richtigen Namen oder sowas, also die auf jeden Fall mit seiner Identität verknüpft war, auf Stack Overflow so Fragen gestellt, die echt irgendwie richtig simpel waren und aber mehr so klangen wie so Werbung für für, äh, für eben Silk Road und so hat der das am Anfang gespreadet und so wurde er dann schlussendlich gebastelt und zwar einer dieser großen Fälle, wie ein Tor-User äh, erwischt wurde und ähm, genau, darauf spielt er gerade an email. Right. Not going to help you. That's the reason why the FBI got that guy. That was the Silk Road owner, Dread Pirate Robert. Essentially, they tracked him all the way back to posts he made on Stack Overflow, followed those, and then went and arrested the guy after pretending to have a lover's quarrel in front of him and that he watched like a moron. And uh, so they stole his laptop. There you go. 50 yard overview for what happened with that guy. No tools can provide absolute protection to the user. None. There's nothing online that you can do that's going to give you 100% protection, okay? This, this being Tor, is not a tool that you can trust perfectly to make you anonymous, hidden, or invisible. Reiterating, okay? Remember, the Tor system relies on a port of Firefox, your local software or proxy, and an internet connection. All of these things make you vulnerable. In addition to that, even being air-gapped, there are ways to get into your system when it is air-gapped. Uh, is everybody familiar with the new proof of concept where they infect your system with malware and then they set up a small piece of hardware that sits there and listens to your power line and they're able to essentially send data through the power line by making your processor spin up and then down, causing a drain on the power line and therefore yeah, they're able to capture data from an infected system just over your power cord. What the okay? fuck? So, so the UPS. <laughs> right. Now this is a fun thing right here. This we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about something that's fun. This video right here uh, is Mark Thomas's Secret Maps of Britain. Again, this is an old video. It's about 46 minutes long. When you have time, watch this. All the things that we've been talking about over the past year are actually in this, except as conspiracy theories. So it's really fun to see them talking about these things as sort of like the British Alex Jones getting really wild and angry about the fact that, did you know they could turn off your cell phone or your telephone during a national emergency? But we now know that as SOP 303. So we know that that was a plan that we've had for many, many years, a standard operating procedure 303. In the event of an emergency, we're shutting your shit down. Like, you're off. You're getting offline. But here, all the way back in the day, that was a rumor. That was a scary thing. Like, what if they did that? What are we going to do? Uh, I really, really recommend watching this video. It's fantastic. Uh, they also talk about sharing data between spying agencies. Uh, they talk about editing maps to hide information. OK? 
kind of like how Google Maps does that. And that was a big conspiracy just a couple of years ago because there was places that are on Google Maps that are the Google Map redacted. Well, guess what? They've been redacting maps forever. Yeah, it's, it's a long-standing map maker's tradition to redact items and also insert false items as a way of knowing if you copied it. Uh -huh. So let's get back to Tor. That's a that's a fun video yeah. that I wish I could watch Student, with all of yeah, you. Yeah. But um, doing okay on time. Yeah. Setting up servers is hard. I'm gonna click on this just to, to show you all. If you're using Apache with default settings, it can unmask your Tor hidden servers. Okay. Setting up. Your server is hard. Just it can be difficult, but it's going to become infinitely more difficult when you start adding an abstraction layer like Tor, worrying about the safety of your users, and incorporating a number of private and government users who all wish to cause you harm or to unmask you. Like setting up your server is difficult, but as soon as you start adding people who are actively trying to hunt you down and figure out where your server is and screw you over, it becomes way harder. Okay. People like Dread Pirate Roberts. We talked about it a few seconds ago. What happened? Didn't know how to work Apache. Was having issues with it. Kept allowing Apache to error out and then to present the real IP address for the Apache server to the users. Criminal mastermind he was not. The thing that kept him going for as long as he went was the people he was up against were not server administrators. They were not super experts in computers. They were not Linux users. Okay, These were people who were entering a what amounts to a new domain in law enforcement who sort of stumbled along. And again, the real reason they found them was because of the Stack Overflow post, not because somebody hacked into a server or they were able to use some magical zero day that they paid $1.7 million to some mystical hacker for. None of that. It wasn't a spy novel. It was somebody to, that eventually brought this guy down. Uh, and let's not forget the internet backbone. I bring it up all the time. There's only a handful of companies that actually do all of the internet for the entire world. And all of them, I think, except for one, is beholden to the US. And so US government can sit at the internet backbone and essentially watch your traffic. And they know where all of the hidden services are. They know what is going on with your system. They can read your emails. They do all of that. That's where all that data is being shoved right up into Utah. You have a giant Utah data center up there that takes all of our information and processes it. That's where that stuff is going. So we have the building. We have the ability. And in addition to that, if you click on the Internet Backbone link right here, if you all are interested in reading about it. There's about seven companies. Yes, there's about seven companies called Tempura. Which is the one that is under, which is the one that is grown when you wrote, not under U.S. Uh, oh, Russia has one that they're trying to do as well. Yeah, Russia has one, and I would suspect China has one, but mostly they just do, they just chill with their little great firewall. But uh, they also monitor traffic, but most of it is internal to China, whereas Russia does a more global view. So anyways, this is Tempura. Go here, start reading about it, because this is exactly what I'm talking about. Hook up to the internet backbone, and then from there, you can sit there and figure out where everything is. So the reason they have to put it in Utah is because they maxed out the power grid in Washington. Well, that and also one of the reasons why they sent it to Utah is because of the high LDS slash Mormon population there, and most of them can pass background checks. And so you have this huge number of people who can pass background? I'm I'm dead serious. They can they can pass background there, and because they can pass background, that's a really huge pool of people that you can pull from. So that's one of the other reasons that they place it there. So JavaScript provides many vulnerabilities as per usual. Okay, if you're using JavaScript, you're already vulnerable. It sucks. Stop using JavaScript. If it was up to me and I was king for the day. I would go out and I would take JavaScript out of every single computer. We'd go back to Gopher and uh, 
I, I don't know. After that, I mean, everything else would be gravy. So now let's start talking about some significant incidents in Tor history. <sighs> Tor has suffered a few scandals. Some of those scandals uh, more important than others, and some of them better reported than others. Oh, that's now, a stein. Let me give you a link here. If you go to this link, that is a chat log. That is a chat log from the IRC dev chat room uh, that documents when an individual, and I'm going to read this word for word because I don't want to mess this up. This is one situation which occurred in which an individual who presented themselves as a State Department employee, and that's very important for those of you who have ever worked in the military or law enforcement, when somebody tells you that they work for the State Department, they don't work for the State Department. Thank you. Achieved employment within the TOR project. They then later revealed they were a member of an American intelligence agency and had joined up with TOR in order to do some good while using false credentials. Okay, And what they said was that they essentially worked for uh, the State Department in a uh, some sort of human resources type role, and that was their cover. They later claimed that the government had no knowledge of their clandestine personal operation to improve TOR. Now, one TOR member was so concerned by this deception and their own situation that they believed their family would be killed. All of that is in the chat log. I recommend reading the chat log. It took me about 35 minutes to 45 minutes, and I was sitting there surfing other web pages while I did it. But you should read the chat logs so that you can get a better understanding of the discussion that was made. Okay. Now that individual uh, goes by MRPHS, and I'm not sure if that's an acronym for something, but his actual real name was Nima Fatini, and I probably butchered that, and I apologize if you're watching this. And this is him right here on his Twitter. So this is the gentleman that this occurred with around the, the major part of the scandal is this guy right here. Oh, he's got a whole bunch of other pictures of his actual face. I wouldn't. I, I don't think he's worried about that. I don't think anybody's concerned about that. But uh, he's an Iranian who functioned as a contributor to the Tor project. He is still a functioning member of the Tor project. But when I say was, he was an Iranian. He's no longer an Iranian, I don't believe. So shortly after this chat occurred, he was immediately moved to the United States and began deploying Tor exit nodes inside of libraries. Back to the library. So I'm going to open this. You can see. I believe we have a full picture of him here. Nope, this is a different one. Sorry. So, anyways, Tor opened up a project where they started deploying exit nodes within libraries. The reason being that by employing these exit nodes at the library, their thought process is this normalizes the act of running an exit node. And if people see criminal stuff happening, well, it's happening at a library, the government wouldn't shut that down, right? It, it begins the process of normalizing. Well, shortly after that happened, the government tracked child pornography back to the library and then shut it down. <laughs> uh, Homeland Security actually stepped in and said, we can't do this, we're shutting this down. Well, then that became an argument, and people got pissed off. And so then... After a great big old fight and argument and a town hall meeting and so on and so forth, they brought it right back up. So we went from toward bad down, toward good up, and now I believe we are currently in the down cycle and they have brought those back down. Uh, as far as I could tell from the stuff that I was seeing, they were down again and I have not seen whether they're back up. So if anybody knows if they're back up, let me know. Was so this Vermont? No, this is. I don't think so. I don't. I don't know. I don't think so, though. So, yes. Even the libraries were held responsible for the content that was being pushed through them. But during the course of the investigation and everything being brought to light, once they realized what was actually going on. It turned into a little bit of an up and down, and I believe that whole part of the project has been dropped, and I don't know of anybody else who is now following that. Okay? 
I can picture the sysadmin looking and just saying, well, what do you want me to do? So Tor is regularly used for hosting child pornography. Let's get it out of the way. All right, Playpen was run by the FBI. Child Play, Child Play was run by the Australian Police Department. Okay. I want you all to keep this in mind. The world's biggest child pornography rings were run by the U.S. government and the Australian government, and they were run on tour, and they were originally set up on tour, and they were seized, and they allowed them to continue to run while they unmasked users. And this, don't even get me started on this, because this gets me super pissed off, because guess what? Pretty much all of the convictions that happened on here were either overturned or dropped because of the fact that they didn't want to reveal how they did it. I can tell you how they did it. It was a JavaScript exploit, undoubtedly. But because they did not want to reveal this information, pretty much everybody that they busted while re-victimizing these children over and over and over again, uh, eventually they just had to let these guys go. And I've been super salty about this for a long time. Uh, but I'm, I don't work in the Fed, so I can't do anything about it. But I bring it to your all's attention so that at least you know about it. The governments are unmasking onion sites. They are taking them over and they are impersonating these sites. I do not know of any efforts to unmask the method used for capturing these sites or understanding the methodology used for defeating Tor. If they are looking into it, they are not doing it publicly. Freenet and I2P, both of them, when they are investigating their vulnerabilities, regularly investigate them publicly. All the information that is available, I have shown you all where that information is available. I've showed you how to get to their GitHub so you can see the question and answers. Everything there, public, over here on the Tor side, them not addressing the fact that many of these sites are being taken over, I have reservations about that. That's a problem for me. I don't understand why these web pages are being knocked over and Tor is not addressing like the giant elephant in the room of, yes, we know that the government is running giant child pornography rings over the Tor network and we're going to figure out how they're doing it and why and take care of it. Or at least address it in some way. I don't know what's going on there. But that is another reason why I do not personally trust the Tor system, okay? What about content? We always go over content. Is there positive content? Well, Tor content includes all open net sites that do not explicitly block Tor use as well as many onion based sites. From there, I'm going to springboard into the idea. If you're going to use Tor, you should probably be a foreign national who is unable to surf the clear net and then use Tor for being able to gain access to public information. That's what Tor is good for. Tor is not good for us. Because here within the United States, it's obvious that they're able to unmask our traffic. They're obviously able to unmask the dot onion sites. They're able to do all of these things. And in addition to that, it paints a giant bullseye on your back. So your use of Tor, probably not necessary. Now, if you were using something like Freenet or I2P, where those systems are a little bit more secure, and in addition to that, your dark nets are a little bit more secure, that would make more sense. But the, uh, the, the dot onions and the tour, I don't see those. In addition to that, the most well-known and notorious criminal-related sites rely on tour due to the manner in which it provides a similar style of platform as the open net for conducting web-based business. What does that consist of? LAMP, right? Linux some sort of web server, Apache or Nginx, and then your PHP, your SQL, and your JavaScript, all of those things combined. So you can run your .onion site, but you can run it just like a regular web page, and then the next thing you know, you're getting popped by the, the whoever it is that wants to gain access to your stuff anyways. So if you are a person who is genuinely concerned about uh, your personal safety because you're sitting there talking about Falun Gong, want people to know about that out in China, and you're personally worried, hey, I could potentially be killed, somebody could kick in the door and gun down my whole family because I'm talking about some religious stuff, well, Tor is probably not going to be your first choice because of the fact that setting up the server is hard, making sure that you stay secure is hard, uh, 
not having the support of that group who is supposed to be sitting there and figuring out how these things are being unmasked so that you can still do your religious or otherwise stuff. Well, if you don't have that support, that's hard too. <coughs> so what? Most users are going to employ Tor for surfing clearnet sites with enhanced security. However, over 1 million users log into Facebook using Tor. What, a day in total? So my assumption is that many of these users live in non-permissive environments that do not allow a connection to Facebook. China. China, legally, you cannot connect to Facebook in China. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say that those people who are trying to use Facebook over Tor have to be from Iran, uh, China, so on and so forth. But guess what? Facebook is an intelligence gathering device that we are providing to foreign nationals to give us our inf their information, pictures, where they go, GPS coordinates, a treasure trove of information for an intelligence analysis person, and we provide that through Tor. Does that make more sense on why those people have access to that stuff? Why that stuff would be made accessible? Okay, following me? No, it's just for the advertising. That's right. And also to keep batteries in Mark Zuckerberg's little wireless charger that he sits on. And a couple of you saw that picture. So how about we answer the questions that we had above? What is Tor? Well, Tor is a peer-to-peer -peer platform that employs the use of a specific browser to function. That's essentially what it is. Users of Tor include doctors, educators, privacy advocates, drug addicts, seditionists, and criminals. Everybody, from grandma on down, can use Tor. Tor functions by allowing users to anonymously share files, browse, chat, and more through the use of the Tor protocol. That's all. If you can do it on the internet, you can probably do it through Tor. Tor uses onion routing while ITP uses garlic routing. And Tor is more focused on accessing servers outside the Tor network while, all two, while I2P and Freenet attempt to minimize connections to the ClearNet. If you need access to the ClearNet, you should probably be using Tor. If you need access to a darknet, you should probably be using something else. Again, I recommend Freenet. Love it. Love Freenet. So our conclusion is, this concludes our three-part deep dive into privacy and enhancing tools. I stand by my statement that I believe Freenet to be the best of the three that were reviewed. Tor provides an interesting tool set designed to provide some very specific protections, but due to the nature in which it is configured, the reliance on the Tor browser, and the historical as well as current issues we have found, I do not recommend this tool set. And I wish deeply that we could build an internet that was designed to be secure from the start. The current assortment of tools for securing us or providing us with privacy are bandages that hide a festering wound. The internet was not made to be secure or private, and we have moved far beyond the point of being able to resolve the issues with the current deployment of tools. It will be some time before we find a resolution for our problem, and I personally believe that we will not find a resolution for the specific issues that plague us. And when I say that, I mean that wholeheartedly with HTTP, HTTPS. That set of protocols and everything that is based off of that was never designed to be secure, and I do not believe that just sitting here and just adding bandages ever going to secure it. We have to find a better way of doing business. So what are my final recommendations for you? I recommend that you register a PGP key. Be able to encrypt stuff, learn how to decrypt things, and how to send signed messages, okay? Use Linux, obviously. Always use Linux. ABC, right? Always be clicking. Contribute uh, to a privacy enhancing project. I recommend Freenet, but pick one. If uh, you like iOS, one, or about, does what you're okay. looking for, contribute to one. The talk so pum, mm. You know what I did? I went to their IRC channel and I said, hey, I'm making these videos. I'm doing these talks. I want to give you an opportunity to review this stuff. You tell me if I'm wrong and if I am factually incorrect, I will make changes, but I will not make any changes if it hurts your feelings. And guess what? Everybody said thanks. It's exactly what we want. I was given heaps of thanks because they couldn't believe that somebody was sitting at a police department who works for law enforcement sitting here talking about this stuff. They were pleasantly surprised. So even something as simple as writing up a little blurb and then talking about it in front of a group of people is enough to contribute. Find a way to contribute. Uh, develop relationships and build your own darknet. 
you need to get network in the real world. You really have to. Nothing beats being able to sit down face to face and know somebody before you guys discuss things. Now, some of it, you can't do it. Again, if you're the Falun Gong practitioner in China and potentially you're going to get your whole family machine gun, I can totally understand you not wanting to meet up with a bunch of people and end up getting run over by a tank or something. That's fine. However, if at all possible, start building those relationships now so you have them. And, of course, if you don't want to contribute to any of that other stuff, at least contribute to an open source project. I can't recommend it enough. Find something open source to contribute to and find a way to give back to the community. So, I'm going to open up. We've got about 10 minutes. Uh, questions? Anything that I didn't cover correctly? Anything like that? What can I help you all with? What's the easiest way to say, hey, I want to help you when contributing to an open source project? Uh, generally, if you go to their GitHub, you'll often find open issues, and good open source projects will often mark those as like beginner, intermediate, and hard, and you'll regularly see this on different projects. Take a look at their GitHub first, see if there's any open issues. If there are not any open issues, then find out if they have an IRC chat room. Go to their IRC chat room and just let them know, hey, I'm a student, I want to learn about how to contribute to open source projects, can somebody give me something easy to start with? And I guarantee you, somebody will jump in there and say, I need somebody to do spell checking or to review this code and make sure that I've commented everything correctly or something, and they'll get you started. They're, it will be very rare when an open source project that is hungry for people will ever turn you away. Well, thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Well, I'll be hanging out here for a few more minutes after this is done, but I can't thank you all enough for spending your Thursday evening coming out here and listening to me talk, and I hope it was a benefit to somebody here. So, thank you. So, what? Das war ein oh, schöner Talk hier von Aaron Jones, Introduction to Tor, auf dem Channel Brian Clough. Äh, das war es auch wieder mal von mir für diese Episode. Äh, wir, wir sehen uns nächstes Mal, äh, wie immer, auf dem gratis erreichbaren Server Lasergurkenland mit der IP 149.202.107.134 oder auch der Domain sillyhoon.com. Alles klar, Leute. Tschüss.